We're going to get started here. Uh, this is our sixth year doing B-Sides Charleston, so I think it's safe to say that we've established a precedent here, and we're not going anywhere soon. Uh, this is also probably the biggest one that we've had. We've had a lot of uh, people coming out, especially our sponsors. Uh, I wanted to go in through and check, like, just go through and list them off for you. Checkpoint, Flashpoint, Fish Labs, Presidio, Soteria, College of Charleston, SecureWorks, Eversec, Foxpick, Pentest Vale, JG Design, ZZ Servers, Darknet Diaries, Michael E. Polito, yeah, someone individually was like, we need you <laughs> to be in this community, so I will donate money. Uh, Mint, No Starch Press, Sparrow Lockpicks, 26 Divine, CHS InfoSec Group, Chaha, Node SC, Reforge, and Rural Tech Fund. Now, these guys were the ones that said, you know, we're going to give back into the community. So when you're out there and you look at the sponsor tables, if you're a decision maker in your business or you're looking for jobs, go check them out and give them a really good chance at, you know, being a part of their team because those guys are the ones that are investing locally here in Charleston. So that's really great. Um, I wanted to bring up Chris Starr here to do a little talk with uh, about College of Charleston. Thank you very much for coming out, guys. Right. Good morning. My name is Christopher Starr. I'm an associate professor of information management here in the School of Business at the College of Charleston. I'm also former chair of the computer science department. I want to welcome you on behalf of Alan Shaw, dean of the School of Business. Um, you might be interested to know that um, the School of Business has created the first technical department um, in, in the school. It's called Supply Chain and Information Management, and it's delivering new levels of abstraction uh, to undergraduates and graduate students in technology, where we have courses that address security in its many forms. Um, as the uh, levels of abstraction and technology continue to mature, we'll see more of our business students come out of the College of Charleston with technical proficiencies so that they can engage with you at, at levels that have been never seen before. So I welcome you to Charleston, the College of Charleston, and the School of Business. Have a great conference. Hi, everybody. I'm Jeannie Rogers. Uh, I run Foxpick, if you don't know me. Hi. <laughs> if you do know me, welcome back. Um, we run the, the Lockpick Village in the back. Uh, after keynotes done, we definitely are open. Come pl uh, play, pick, learn how to pick if you haven't. We also have a challenge. Um, it's $3 cash, $5 card. The challenge, all the proceeds go to Hack for Kids. And we will have prizes. I don't know what the prizes are. I think Sparrow Lockpick set is one of them. Um, but definitely come by, play, donate money, learn new things, and have a great time at the con today. Thanks, guys. Uh, there's also going to be a CTF running at 10 o'clock, and there is a special challenge on your badge. If you can figure out how to get to it and you play it, there's also prizes for that. So hey, all you crypto guys, that's a hint. <laughs> Check it out. Uh, so our keynote speaker here uh, actually runs one of the most technical Mauer reversing blogs on the internet today. He single-handedly has taught a lot of people how to reverse various samples from Drydex to uh, Danabot, and he, he's going to do a really great talk today. So I want to just, without further ado, introduce Vitaly, our first keynote of the day. Good morning, everybody. It's definitely a pleasure and a great honor to, to join in Charleston. It's actually my first time in Charleston. Well, the first time I, uh, I was talking to Paul, actually one of my colleagues at Flashpoint, uh, where I was invited, I was actually felt like that's one of the conferences I want to really want, want to attend, not only because of the new location, but also of the caliber of researchers I've seen constantly from this area. And 
from Paul and TJ. I know I've been working quite closely investigating some of the most complex botnets in, in the past. So one of the subjects I want to talk about for, for the keynote is just the charting the next cybercrime frontier or evolution of criminal intent. Just a quick background. Uh, I work actually at Flashpoint. Uh, it's also one of, the, one of the sponsors of the event. So I'm a director of research and I run a technical team at Flashpoint. So we focus on looking into various uh, e criminal and APT threats, but also we look into underground ecosystem. So part of my agenda is also to tell you more about what the underground is and who the actors behind it and provide you more uh, visibility into some of those communities, but also uh, char chart and explain what's the current threats as we see them and what's the future would be uh, in terms of them. And it will go through very specific case studies. I previously work at, worked at the US government in the Cybercrime Bureau investigating some of the top uh, criminal gangs. So one of them is, of course, uh, Dridex was one of them, but also many, many others. So I come from a very technical, but also a very investigative intelligence background. So it also helps in our work at Flashpoint to do some counterintelligence and looking into some of the most protected criminal networks that we've been tracking. So the content will be based upon some of the uh, bullet points that I'm out outlining is one of the, we're gonna talk about the deep and dark web, what it is and why it's so important for us to know and track some of those communities. We'll also talk about the malware toolkits. We'll trace back uh, the, first of all, the threat actors who we've been looking into, who the criminals behind the attacks we see in our networks or anywhere else. But we also talk about the evolution of from malware as a toolkit to malware as a service, and then the, we, we call it cyber criminal corporate groups. The groups are not longer uh, script kiddies, if you will, but they are very sophisticated, they're professional career criminals targeting us uh, and essentially investing heavily into uh, exploiting some of the network access they obtain. We'll talk about how the cyber criminal underground fuels some of the attacks that we've seen from uh, the case study. I have a trick bot, which is a banking trojan in that case. We'll also talk about the, the how it actually works and how those groups look within, uh, from our perspective, as we've been tracking them. And we'll talk about specifically TrigBot and their structure. Then we'll also discuss what some of the newer tactics we've seen on the e-crime and uh, digital e-crime system. We'll talk about how the criminals uh, employing, for instance, um, methods to steal proprietary intellectual property algorithms and also source code and the merge and acquisition data for insider trading, specific to the GOZI ISFB botnet. And we'll also talk about the uh, new modules actually from TrigBot. TrigBot just released a new module hunting for point of sale terminals through the LDAP. So we'll talk about that, but also talk about the account checking activity and what, why, it is, why it means so much for us to track those big breaches of the day and uh, making sure we always change our passwords. We'll also talk about the key takeaways, of course, and uh, what's the future and what's next on the e-crime ecosystem. So what's the day cybercrime is, and in terms of our visibility at Flashpoint and how we track criminals. So what happened it in, in current in 2018, the criminals are more sophisticated than ever. The hacks are more well orchestrated and the groups are definitely more advanced than they ever were. Back in the early days, they were just uh, deploying malware and toolkits, but no longer that's the case. They also rely on a robust cyber criminal infrastructure to support them and the ecosystem. So for example, not only, uh, it's not only, it's not a job of one person any longer to, to deploy attacks, but it's a, cor uh, it's a corporate structure where every criminal plays their role uh, in that, and also they collaborate together on various breaches, as we talked about the TrickBot case. And uh, again, very sophisticated money mo moving capabilities. The criminals learn how to do fraud, finally. From back in the early days, they didn't do how to do man in the middle. They didn't know how to sniff traffic, and they just really uh, relied on some password stealing malware. It's not longer the case. Uh, and also the skill operators led to the big data problems. So criminals currently amassed huge botnets and they definitely looking into uh, providing the most uh, bang for the buck in terms of those botnets. They're looking into finding the most juiciest ones, the ones that have access to internal networks, the ones that have access to point of sale terminals. So that's the key value assets for them. And for them, as, as, as the botnets are so big and the data that they accumulate is so huge, it means that uh, they really need a better data science on their backends to index them. So think about the criminal groups right now, they're really like mini startups. Uh, like if we kind of analogize some of the security companies might be, uh, they're running their operations as security companies like or anti-security companies, employing different uh, affiliates and also uh, running operations very smoothly. So that's the state of the e-crime. And again, it's no longer focused on just financial institutions. Now large of, large, lots of other companies are affected, including law firms, even healthcare, because of the fact that they still harbor 
valuable information and assets that's still valuable to criminals in nation state groups. And it's also the underground ecosystem plays well into that. And, and it's so important to realize that uh, these actors do not act in, iso in isolation. Oftentimes they, they learn from each other, learn the tricks and share methods and methodologies that target us. So we'll talk more about these use cases as we go along. So before we even start looking into this, I wanna just give a primer on a deep and dark web. It's essentially, deep and dark web, it's, it's uh, essentially a term and essentially a way for us at Flashpoint to track some of those underground ecosystem communities. And uh, the way it's also, why it's so important because they serve as venues for criminals and different groups to exchange information, ideas. Think about our infosec communities that we have. They also have their own anti-infosec communities and they share ideas and methodologies that tar how to target us. So that's why uh, it's important for us to look into them and study them because we can glean a lot of insights into what the future might be in terms of the attacks and the sophisticated ecosystems. So generally, like w when we say, what's the deep and dark web? We don't refer to surface web. We don't, meet, we don't refer to Twitter. We don't refer to anything on Google you can find through Google Engine. We refer to something that's protected either through vetted accesses. You need to have some human intelligence, to, uh, human assets to get in. For instance, you need to convince the criminals that you are uh, not a criminal, actually not a researcher, not a law enforcement officer. So and it takes some time and practice. And government used to do a lot of that. It's called uh, kind of like intelligence operations, getting access to criminal communities, staying close to them as we can, gain intelligence and uh, writing uh, essentially intel reports, but also providing visibility into the most sophisticated groups that we know of. And the deep and dark web, if, if you use Tor browser, uh, it's called a dark web. It requires specific software. Think about I2P. Um, uh, onion, that onion websites, that's when we call dark web. When we say deep web, we mean the forums and specific communities that can be accessed through normal browser behavior. However, they require specific either invite code or knowing the administrators or the bad guys to, to, to provide you access. So you need to bypass the virtual bouncers to get into some of those communities. And that's when we call deep web. So there's a difference and we essentially, we've seen the most interesting communities, the most interesting targeting we've seen in all the groups that we track of, TrickBot, Drydex, Zeus, all of them have roots in the, in the other underground ecosystem. It's actually fuels, not only it serves as a platform for them to get in, to know each other, but also a platform to resell their goods. So that's why it's so important. But it's also pretty hard to get access to that and maintain that because it requires you to be part of the uh, clique of criminals who are very uh, alert to being surveyed by law enforcement and other, and other individuals. So it's almost like an intel operation that we have. So and why do threat actors need the dark web per se? Uh, it's just really important for them. It's not only exchange of ideas, exchange of products, it's also marketplaces and recruitment. It's also training professional development and of course financial services. And it is like sounds like business for them. And in fact, it's very similarly uh, framed as it is. And uh, essentially, the dark web is still, up to these days, one of the most important nexuses. Like back in the government days when I used to work on cases, we used to always have um, a home deeper investigation or target breach. We knew that the common angle was always being the dark web or the dark web marketplaces. So it always has been hidden from our visibility, hidden from our view. So this presentation, I want to unveil some of that, but also connect back to some of the cyber, sophisticated cyber criminal groups that we've been tracking on. So, and yet again, so threat actors must communicate, they must coordinate, they must learn, recruit, buy, and sell. And as I mentioned earlier, it's no longer a lone wolf operation, but rather orchestrated and well-funded enterprise. Uh, and also those communications, <laughs> from our perspective, provide unique visibility, and unique visibility into the indicators of compromise, and as also the tactic techniques and procedures they would use to attack us. So, in terms of threat landscape of actors, just wanna briefly outline that. So we separate into kind of like, kind of five different buckets. We know we have hackers or you know, communities of individuals who of course file bugs and you know, um, uh, do responsible disclosures. There's somebody who's not necessarily following that. There's a white hat, black hat uh, actors, of course, uh, or individuals. There's hacktivists, hacked, uh, hackers for cause. And they're upset about something. They just don't wanna, wanna use the cyber as a means to essentially explain or you know, essentially uh, get their point across. We have criminals who of course, oftentimes we classify them as financially motivated. Their intent is really extract more value and, m and money and assets from their attacks. We also have nation state actor <laughs> groups, B, B teams as we call it. It's nation state, state groups that are, are just competent. They, know, they oftentimes get caught. Uh, we oftentimes see blogs written about them. We oftentimes think about them as quite noisy. 
And that some of these groups, are, you, you, it reminds me of the, some of the Russian nation state groups are now quite, quite, uh, quite, fitting, the, quite fitting actually nation state B teams. And of course we have nation state A teams, the groups that have invested lots of money and assets and oftentimes they have uh, quite, 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 quite a large backing from the government <coughs> to, to deploy zero days and exploits, very sophisticated and very quiet. You never see much of that. So, but again, yet in our, in our course of view, there's a still actors who try to buy, to pass to somebody else, right? So we call it the false flag operation too. But it's something just I wanna outline and have that perspective as we go along the presentation. So when we talk about the criminal deep and dark web system, I want you to think of this as a four different steps and four different ways to categorize some of those communities. Because the underground system, while it's huge and, and massive, it still can be separated into four logical groups as I look into that. Uh, one's called group intrusion groups, so specific communities focused on intrusion aspect of that where criminals can share hacking tools and toolkits, essentially how to target us, but also they can find people like uh, breach actors who can deploy their, method, uh, deploy their tools, they can hire them to compromise networks. We also have <coughs> data markets. Those are the communities where they can sell the stolen data to, and they can find potential buyers and of course affiliates they can be engaged with. And also we have shopping. Some of, this, some of these communities relate to, um, they facilitate shopping of the dark web, if you will. So they speak and promote some of the services sold on the underground. Yet again, it's very important when you look into sophisticated groups too, because they oftentimes rely on the shoppers to either buy their stolen goods and or, you know, essentially services. So it's very important. And reshipment. Reshipment is a very important aspect too, because reshipment allows them to, to cash out some of the digital proceeds and move money from different jurisdictions, and that's quite, quite a method to do in the underground as we call it. So from the intrusion aspect, I wanna just describe you. This is back in the early days, there was a malware called SpyEye, you might be familiar with. And this is kind of like, you can find advertisement of somebody selling new malware kits or new malware for, for sale or new loaders or new cryptos, uh, credentials, data stealing malware, traffic, you can buy some traffic for your malware. If you're running, of course, maybe some uh, sophisticated SEO operations or exploit kits, you can procure <coughs> Uh, spammers who can distribute spam. And those generally, those type of communities fall into that intrusion category bucket when we call it, uh, when we discuss them. Um, the second type of communities uh, I wanna talk about, it's they fall into the data markets. And the product and services they've been offered is stolen credit card data, stolen uh, account data, stolen uh, essentially authorization checkers, account credentials, anything else that they can extract from a form grabber or some type of like, um, login credentials, stealing malware. And those communities are actually focused on reselling this data to the highest bidder, but also to the criminals who can use this data and go shop around. So that was critical for, for them. And that's how the underground works. Uh, uh, the, the breach actors are aligned on the data markets to upsell sell their data. Another aspect when you look at the underground is, and those specific communities map to those categories, is the shopping area. And those are the, sh the services as offered by criminals. One of the services is called call-in services. For instance, you can hire a criminal to call into the bank account and impersonate a victim for $15. Uh, they can call in and provide any female or male voice and try to ask, ask the bank official to pass the transaction. So criminals still need some of that to bypass some of the anti-fraud measures that the financials <coughs> or e-commerce website deploy. And also anti-detect browsers. On a, on a screenshot, there's an anti-detect browser uh, that was sold in underground for $5,000 allows the criminal groups, such as Streetbot and many others, to essentially do account takeover fraud successfully. But of course there's also um, tradecraft tutorials where they share methods and exact tactics. One of the interesting quote from a criminal I was actually reading lately was on, they explained to, to, to each other and explained to how the, the best approach of targeting uh, or hiring rather mules for their operations. And they would say politeness is, is thief's main weapon. You should be polite but also, also be firm when calling your mules. And uh, you should remember that you and, you and we, Americans, they refer to, think differently. And uh, you, should, you should not only send them emails as via like type, type of like drop uh, shipping projects, but also try to create a di uh, healthy working atmosphere to make sure the fraud works. So it's kind of an interesting insights you can glean just by looking into some of those communities and, and the aspects of them. And the fourth is just reshipment. And this is kind of something that very cr critical and very important for you to understand because reshipment plays into uh, mule recruitment handlers, copywriting projects, translation, drop projects. And uh, on a screenshot, I'm um, showing you the staff control panel. This is the panel when the criminals are interested in cashing out their big botnets, 
they would essentially have also job recruitment scams. And the TrickBot actually does it, and many other banking malware too. They ask for mules to get a uh, work from home job. They oftentimes ask people to receive wires into uh, from, as from the company on, from Craigslist. So if you have ever been asked to receive a wire on, from Craigslist, never do that, because you, you can be duped into um, the, the crime uh, scam. And also, as because scammers themselves, they also, once they get their mules and get their uh, victims, they would put their information into drop control panels. So they can control how much this mule uh, ships, how much money do they, do they actually launder for me, how much how successful they are for us. And, the, and again, call and, ser call and services too. If you ever have difficulties with your mules and if you don't speak English well, the criminals also rely on some of the act, um, criminal groups in the US to, to call the bank accounts and just make sure to unlock some of the fraud and just be successful. So yet again, that's another aspect of underground which is critical for you to understand as we move along. And this is the basis of primarily of the prison that I'm looking into, the paradigm of the crime system that we're gonna be talking through. So before we start looking into some of the current or sophisticated groups of the future, it's good to step back, uh, to step back and look into the malware of the past. So back in the early 2000s, I would say, when you look at this sophisticated malware, uh, they trace back to the 2000s, actually it's quite, it's quite new, when specific to the banking malware side. It's only first attempts been made, and one of the most prolific malware was called at that time called Pinch, if you might be familiar with, a developer of one of the Russian actors on the criminal forum. He was caught, but they developed a spy module, this is a screenshot of how this malware looked like. So the criminals at that time, they could buy this specific software and be successful in doing some basic fraud. At that time, actually, the banks were not too sophisticated, they didn't know much about the crime systems as they, di as they do now. And there's no uh, sophisticated man in the middle attacks back then, just basic auto-inject capabilities where the criminals could essentially subvert money and move money from bank account to another one just pure by this malware. Another malware you might be familiar with, it's called Bank Patch, Hacks Door, Limbo. Those are the malware of the past that was super uh, important for the evolution. However, they've just been just software. So we've just been selling a software package. So when you buy that, they'll give you a source, uh, source code, you compile the source code, and you can use for attacks. It hasn't been uh, a long sustained operation because it's, you know, the, the botnet, uh, or the, or the malware developer, uh, we still relied on them to, d to deliver new source code if it fails, so, but it's also not very reliable. It's not sustainable to do major, major e-crime. So from 2006 to 2010, that's the rise of the financial e-crime. That's when the Zeus, uh, Banking malware appeared and it was authored by Russian national under the alias Slavic. So at that time, it's the original cybercrime kit as we know of. And this is kind of the root of many, many other kits that emerged uh, later in the days that we still track on up, up to this day. One of the interesting things, this is uh, kind of a, now anyone can run attacks. And it's no longer they sell malware as a software package, they sell you support system that give you essentially uh, turnkey solutions. So they give you specific instructions, they help you to set your malware on the server, they help you to bypass certain you know, um, anti-filtering, they help you to monitor the botnets to make sure it's healthy. So it's actually, they take, take model to next step. They say, okay, we've been quite successful with just software, but we wanna just go to the next level, which would be to provide more support to some of the sophisticated groups. So they can be more, more successful on the fraud side. At the end of the day, what they care a lot about making more money. So, and that, uh, that's what the software turnkey solutions allowed that. And Slavic was the originator of this model. He spent so much time looking into some of the sophisticated uh, attacks. He'd been recruited one of the top teams in the underground. He was looking for the best fraudsters. He was looking for the best spammers to join the team to, to also provide more visibility to him and build his own. And uh, from that stand, stand, uh, standpoint, a bunch of other new malware emerged in a very similar model. The Spy Eye, of course, uh, which has also been run by a Russian national who has also been arrested but uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, currently. Uh, Carborg, too. Those are the, just names of the malware that emerged following the Zeus uh, model. What's an interesting thing on the e-crime system was that everybody was looking up to Zeus as the golden standard of how to do attacks uh, and how to do financial fraud and how to do sophisticated malware. So that's uh, still up to this day. That's a very important aspect of their operations. And this is very critical. Whenever you analyze and think about the attacks of tomorrow or future, you should remember that they have roots in the past. And some of the actors we see today are still very well connected to the top criminals of the past, including Slavic himself. 
So from 2011 till uh, now, actually, we have malware as a service as, as a way to do e-crime fraud. So uh, back, th back then, there was Zeus peer-to-peer group. Uh, they referred to themselves as a business club. They actually took a next level of, of approach to the e-crime system. They decided to, we're not just not going to be even do uh, malware turnkey solutions. We're actually going to be working with exclusive group of people or criminals who can be very successful. Rather than selling the malware and forums and underground, it's kind, it's kind of like a, it was a pain for them. The reason why, because there's so many unhappy customers, it requires so much support, it requires so many, so many unhappy buyers, plus the law enforcement was looking into them. So they realized, instead of doing that, why don't you just work in a closer group of people? At the time, actually, Slavic Leaks, the Zeus uh, Toolkit uh, 2.0.8.9 uh, on one of the forums and releases all the rights to spy one of his competitors. And, and, and pretended to be he's going away from the e-crime system. But in fact is, he not only was not going away, but he formed a very close group of people, it was called uh, Zeus Peer-to-Peer, -peer, who they worked um, with each other essentially on uh, and a big, big, big fraud. At that time also another group emerged, was called uh, Bugat, if you might be familiar with. Bugat traces, traced back to Drydex actually. Group before Drydex became a phenomenon in the most sophisticated banking malware as we know of, it was called Group Boat Bugat. And they called it themselves also World, World Bank Center. They kind of uh, create themselves in groups, they kind of like interesting uh, models. They're not, not just a malware model, not only as, uh, a, not even a turnkey model, but they call themselves a club that's meant to make money. And the way they make money is they're targeting uh, the financials and corporations and many, many, uh, all, all of us essentially. So for them it's, and yet again, the fraud amounts got so much higher than they ever were. They realize new potentials to essentially steal more, more data using the, file, using the malware and essentially be successful. And, uh, and that's one of the time, the first time the business club introduced also CryptoLocker, which was, was the first real ransomware, as we know, ransomware <coughs> as a service. Back then also ransomware was never being a, a such a ransom as a service. It was just similarly like a, a tool and malware you could deploy. In that case, they realized to squeeze more value from their botnet, they just need to, Slavic realized, he will push the uh, CryptoLocker on one of the infections, which has also caused lots of Lots of actually confusion and lots of disagreement amongst the criminals themselves because at that time they also thought that ransomware is an ethical dilemma and it shouldn't be deployed in infection because it kills the good bots that can be used for financial fraud. Kind of an interesting nugget from that. But that's one of the first time the actual first real scalable ransomware was uh, emerging. Another way, it's just yet again, it was another way to monetize the infections. So Dyer, which is now we call TrickBot Group, it's clearly they're all connected, not only by, based on the infrastructure, but the actors too. And Drydex, they also learn from Slavic Business Club. And the reason why they learn from Slavic Business Club, because they've been customers of Zeus Peer to Peer actually. And the reason why it's so important for us to think about the past as a predictor of the future, is to look into from which, which ecosystem they emerged. So the current attacks, they're also still up to this day traceable to one single important individual under the name of Slavic. At that time, he was actually also outed by the uh, the Department of Justice and the FBI, and still up to this day is a $50 million bounty. Uh, so if you ever f find him in Russia somewhere, you can make a lot of money. <laughs> he, uh, he likes to sail, and he likes, uh, he, you know, he has his own mansion in somewhere in the south of Russia. So still up to this day, he's probably one of the most successful cyber criminal lords of the past. Not because of even the money, but also the impact he left on the other e-crime groups. And it was another thing is like this, that time another model was emerging. As we researchers write blogs and think about, talk, discuss how criminals essentially target us or write malware analysis or uh, essentially release some information. We also criminals, so criminals copying actually and looking into us to an extent. They start very uh, inquisitively looking into uh, what researchers have been doing and essentially looking at reading the blogs diligently as, as we all do and essentially providing methods and uh, actually providing some anti-researcher <laughs> methods and improving their security. At that time also, the Zeus peer-to-peer, -peer, the reason why it's called Zeus peer-to-peer, -peer, it's an inf in fact partially because of the protocol they used. They decided to go away from one single server or single point of failure, whereas one single backend the malware would call every single time because it's susceptible to takedowns and you can always sync all that. But they were like, okay, we're gonna build a peer-to-peer -peer protocol. So think about the torrents or think about the BitTorrent we would use clients or I2P protocol. So essentially, we would uh, would release, we send the message across the chain of uh, of peers, 
So the law enforcement will never know where the actual backend is because they can only distribute through second tier proxies and uh, then through the main drop location and then also the backend. So it's very hard to do that. And it provides more resiliency for them. So the criminals also realize you have to stay more successful. Even by and large, when you think about the e-crime system, think about this in the cat and mouse game. Because as we deploy methods and protections, like for instance on the good side, the criminals that try to be a st ahead of st uh, stay ahead of, ahead of us, essentially try to subvert all these methods. So it's, it's still up to this day, it's a cat and mouse game when, we, when you think about them. So moving to the present day, and we know Zeus is gone, Slavic disappeared from the underground or from, and also from our view as well. He's no longer this shadowy figure that we know of. He, the Zeus peer-to-peer -peer was taken down and by law enforcement, the, um, some of the malware from the past disappeared, but we have new, two new groups emerged, and actually even more, three groups, I would say main ones. Drydex, TrickBot, and Gozi ISOB, which is also an older malware. So these groups are very selective, and uh, we still don't know, what, don't know really what Slavic is doing up to this day, but uh, very interesting if you, if you ever find across <laughs> come across of him. Uh, so let's talk about the TrickBot, and we'll talk about the TrickBot is the current uh, malware that you can see in your networks uh, day in and day out, along with Emotet, which is another malware that's very active now. Uh, so what's interesting about that b a botnet value model is for them, as we talked earlier, is what they deal with, the criminals, they deal with essentially big data problems. So they amass so many infections, so many data, so they cannot really reliably tell like how can they be, you know, essentially find the, the good information. They actually employ the same similar methods. They discussed uh, building their own elastic search cluster, for example, uh, as like professional DevOps to make sure they can scale their operations and just be successful. It's no longer just the PHP scripts. They also deploy uh, uh, mo MVC mod mo models as well, model view controller. So uh, all the old PHP SQL injections don't work on their backends, for example. So they become more successful. But also their backend are really so focused on indexing data and making sure the criminals can find the most valuable assets immediately. Um, <coughs> And uh, that's when they started tro uh, trolling or looking for information, we call it high value targets. It's no longer our machines to be of the highest interest to them, but what the biggest thing interest for them is the corporate networks, environments with uh, direct access to payment networks like SWIFT gateways, gateways, ATM environments, um, point of sale networks, as I mentioned earlier, but also lots of hospital clinics, legal institutions for ransomware, of course, and many, many other things. So in those <coughs> HVT is always, we call them high value targets. Uh, they get hit with the most sophisticated attacks we've ever seen. That's when the open times you see the group's capabilities and they would deploy different modules once they identify and uh, those uh, machines of interest. So for many cases in that, those cases, TrickBot is only the first uh, stage of the multi-loan attack where they would deploy additional malware and uh, be successful as such. And those groups also feed into the Russian ecosystem as I discussed earlier, on the ground ecosystem. So they originate from the same deep and dark web community where they recruit people to help them with this indexing of data. So for example, if you are a good scientist, data scientist, there's a demand for you on the dark web <laughs> because criminals definitely need more data science support in their botnets, as well as they need better spa spammers too. But, uh, but that's how this eco ecosystem fits into their own models. They use it for and recruit and also sell the data on the dark web. And yet again, this is, uh, it's all the idea of squeezing every single dollar, uh, euro from, from, from the bots. And it's again, come, uh, going from the HVT model uh, and you know, men in the middle attacks, so which was traditional focus of this group. So they've been focusing so much on targeting uh, banks and essentially looking into financials. But now they've been also looking into expanding that. And I'll talk more about three very specific use case and what this group was doing. And uh, again, they've been focusing on big data and thinking about how they can find the most interesting information quickly, immediately, and uh, reliably. And again, it's not, uh, it's becomes, logic becomes a little bit different from the malware as uh, uh, kids or malware as a service. They rely on operators, they rely on actors to log into net to those backends and search for data. They rely on rich uh, criminals to essentially uh, get access through their high value infection, get into the networks, you know, move laterally and deploy different, different, different toolkits, for example. And yet again, it's another way for them to monetize, and it's another way of evolution of this group. And this is how the typical group of TrickBot, when you think about them, and this is actually kind of very similar to what they have actually now. So at the top of the group, there's always a kingpin, or a group, a group of key, uh, key actors, 
And essentially the operations look like literally like business operations or think like small startups. It's no longer the groups are uh, supported by one key individual in underground who is so impactful or a group of actors who are very, very successful at convincing new newcomers to join their clique. It has to do with the professionalizing. Those are guys of career, uh, professional career criminals. So this was how the corporate structure looks like. They rely on botnet masters to, mon to manage their installs, uh, to manage their bots, and essentially to, look, to make sure the infections are good. They maintain a steady rate of new in inflow infections. Um, they also make sure there's no researcher infections and clean from AV antivirus bots as well. Uh, they also rely on finance. Finance is, finance is huge for them because they rely on fraud operators and money mule actors to help them move the money across the chain. So for TrickBot, stealing the bank credentials, it's only one first step in a long way of cashing out and making money. So they still rely on a different group of actors to do that. They have product management support. They have a dedicated cryptor or the criminal actor who is able to make sure the malware is every time bypasses at least um, 30 different antivirus solutions. And that requires them to crypt it, and encrypt it in a way that pack the malware so it looks different every single time. It looks new, and it's undetectable to the antiviruses. They also rely on uh, bot developers, loader developers, and exploit R&D kind of uh, <laughs> research and development. Q&A, like for example, before the TrickBot drops the new module or they deploy a new module, they oftentimes test for a month to make sure the module works as, as it should. So there's also a, a, there's a development cycle that goes through some of those groups that we might not see because we are still too focused on the email attacks or something like that. But our visibility allows us to really outline that. And uh, the re one of the interesting things, one of the three uh, topics I want to talk about from TrickBot and what's the future of those type of attacks we've seen uh, is that the, we call it zombie passwords or account checking activity, those big botnets become essentially uh, huge, not only uh, herders of the valuable information, but it can also use as socks or, or, or essentially bodies to even for attack. So in this case, when we talk about the TrickBot, they've been also deploying uh, a module which is called BackConnect Proxy. And it's all fueled by big breaches of the day. As you read in the news about LinkedIn breach or Yahoo or um, any other one that lately, even Facebook, you think about what's the effect it would have on e-firm systems. Because the reason why it's they would use the same passwords that in emails from LinkedIn breach, and they would simply add it to their account check-in proxy, and they would try to see if it's possibly ever been matched in some other services. So this is yet another way for them to monetize the infections. And this has to do with the big data, because they have so many different uh, valuable credentials that being, allows them to be very successful. And it affects all of us. Uh, all of us, it's to the level of we, we all have accounts and we all in the past been compromised or compromised or our accounts have been affected by some of the big breaches of the day. So that's what the criminal has been doing. And it has been exploited in a very automated way. So that's what they do pretty much automatically. And uh, this is what, what, they, what I call their uh, TrickBot uh, BackConnect proxy module. It's used, for, it's used for two things. One, it allows the criminals to back connect to the compromised machine essentially so the machine will call back to their back end they can hop into the machine and do account takeover fraud log into the session of the bank and just wire money to the mule account but another thing what they've been doing is they've been essentially de uh, de using this module to use and using your machine and your IP if it's good enough it's if it's not on any spam lists they would use this machine to launch attacks or against against multiple websites essentially we uh, help them to identify good logins and credentials and the way it works, you essentially get got affected by TrickBot. The TrickBot identifies you to be a machine of interest or machine that, that would decide to deploy this BackConnect module. Once they deploy the BackConnect module, BackConnect module will connect to another server that they control of, similar as part of this model. They receive a commands and essentially receive a proxy list and, they'll receive, a, uh, and receive the target list as well. So oftentimes when you, when you, if you're researching yourself and you have in your own lab to do malware reverse engineering with TrickBot, oftentimes you would see suspicious traffic going to some third party social media sites. But that's when you know that you've been infected by the TrickBot <coughs> BackConnect module. And yet again, another way for them to monetize their infection. So this is kind of uh, the ecosystem around <coughs> that. What, another interesting aspect of TrickBot and uh, what we've been tracking also on that end was the special access by LDAP enumeration. So when, we, when criminals also realize that getting access to corporate environments allows them to deploy similar methods that the pen testers would use, or red teamers would use, 
Uh, essentially, like I remember back in my days, one of the first thing you would do when you are in a, in a corporate environment, you would want to dump the lightweight uh, directory protocol access. So you want to see if there's any XML configuration saved from the corporate environments. So that's what Criminal has been doing. They developed a very specific domain uh, DLL, 32 DLL module, which is meant to be essentially, once infected, they want to enumerate what other accesses and connections that machines might have. So it includes group XML, so it parses XML files that's stored on the uh, account, account domain controller. Again, very, very smart way of monetizing their infections, just be thinking beyond financial fraud. So, and actually there's a very interesting exploit actually been developed on top of the LDAP enumeration by one of the researchers, Sean Metel, uh, that you can definitely look into that. Because LDAP is still, up to this day, one of the top sources for great uh, um, corporate asset information. It's yet again, they're learning how to exploit corporate accesses. Another week ago, actually, we've seen a new module emerged, um, which is called uh, P uh, PSPIN32. And what the idea for that module was to, as the holiday season approaches, the trick by group also matures, and they've been looking into machines uh, with point of sale terminals, or machines that have any point of sale software installed on them. And this is kind of an IDA Pro uh, image of reversing this malware. As you would see, they're looking for the POS devices, or machines that have POS uh, names and groups. They look for uh, machines that have cache registers, micros, POS terminals installed. And that's yet fits into the model of the new evolution of the e-crime. They no longer are interested in just uh, stealing malware or da data. They want to parse their infections for suitable uh, targets or high value targets to be called HVT. So after this day, we're still like not sure what the final module that would deploy or was the final point of sale malware they would deploy. But it's still uh, actually very recent, very fresh. We're still investigating that angle. And it's meant for actually target uh, brick and mortar Re merchants and retailers, similar, similar like a target. So yet again, another day, another way for them to look into their infections and approach them from a data science perspective and say, what else can we extract? What's the value we can get from them? And in this case, with the holiday season approaches, they also time it very perfectly. As in the US and many other countries, there's a holiday season and we can all gonna go shopping. And TrickBot is already looking for machines that have POS terminals installed. So that's the future would be. and. And that's how we essentially track this group, by looking at the modules and reversing them. Another very interesting group I want to discuss with you, it's called, uh, we call them GOZI ISFB, but it also has roots into going back to 2007 into the 76 service, developed by one again Russian national, uh, Nikita Kuzmin. And the reason why this group is so interesting, because they rival in sophistication and maturity of TrickBot. And they also run a very similar corporate cybercrime um, ecosystem, and they essentially, what they've been interested in targeting, they've been targeting the um, proprietary intellectual property documents, merges and acquisition inside of trading. And uh, as, the, as the way the e-crime system matures, as the way the future holds for us, as we, as also, as the way we move away from tangible assets to intangibles more and more, the cloud storages and many, many other ways to store our data, the criminals are hunting for some of those assets. In that specific instance, um, They've been looking for essentially um, law firm networks where the documents or letters of intent, emergency and acquisition data, so they can essentially use it for insider trading. And not only from insider trading, we also have some visibility into some, the, what they've been doing is back in Russia, they would uh, stand up, uh, for example, a high frequency trading account, and they would trade the stolen information from the Gozi ISB botnet or, some, or procure some other means to essentially to, uh, to cash out via stock manipulation. Very interesting way of doing fraud. Very interesting novel ways of maturing beyond the malware kit models, the malware as a service. And, uh, and why target intellectual property? The reason why is pretty simple because at the end of the day, when you think about when you're tasked with defense or networks, when you're a defender, one of the most high value assets, and if you go to the Intel team, you ask CISO, it's oftentimes intellectual property. The traits, uh, the, the secret sauce that what makes the company be in the business. But the criminals are hunting for that. They also realized, for example, in many ways in this case that oftentimes uh, third party risk or thinking about the law firm networks are gateways to some of the most protected uh, clients that they might have. So thinking about breaches and accesses as gateways to another accesses. That's another way of thinking about breaches because breach is only the beginning of another longer attack they can use to target more sophisticated you know, networks or get even deeper into environments. 
yet again, so that's something important to keep note of. Here, just I want to show like a few screenshots of some of the malware that uh, we've been looking into. This is ISFB, again, uh, used IDA Pro in the first screen, uh, screen, uh, screen image. You can see it's loader module, they would actually call loader DLL. And the second module is called essentially uh, client DLL. But you can also see that internally they call it RM3 loader. Yet again, malware for analysis for many ways for me is provides additional Intel assets, Intel value to glean, to learn more about the criminals. And um, pretty interesting group and something to look forward to because of their uh, very specific targeting of intellectual property assets uh, going beyond and extending beyond just financials or legal sector or anything else. Yet another, uh, another way for them to plug into the e-crime system. And actually what they've been doing with the, with the stolen data, they would also hire and st set up their own offshore accounts where they would use to generate accounts, activity, and move it across and cash out. Very interesting and very sophisticated yet again. So at the end and the closing of, of my presentation and keynote is I would love to talk about the state of the cybercrime and what is actually is next. Back in the early days, we've seen that, that we, we deployed malware as toolkits. We deployed malware, the criminals deployed malware as turn, turnkey as solutions. They deployed different other means to uh, target, which is very automated, but also not too sophisticated. And as the industry matured, as the financial industry, for example, they elevated their standards and essentially they can uh, detect those basic attacks pretty easily. Uh, what happens is the criminals move to the corporate cyber criminal groups. The corporate cyber criminal groups are those are the ones I mentioned earlier, TrickBot, Drydex, um, Gozi ISFB. Those groups, it's, it requires coordination of both the malware and the very sophisticated actors involved. It's no longer uh, actors like you know criminals sitting in the basement and hacking into different environments. It requires them to have an office space oftentimes and oftentimes run their business operations as, as an actual business, as a small yeah. startup. So that's what's critical to know. Yet it's more expensive for them to build and maintain, but the persistence and uh, the long-term effect and success of them is, is so much visible and so much more, uh, so much better than just simply deploying malware and toolkits and networks of the past. So, so that's what the matured. And yet again, one of the interesting things is we also have seen the trend of, uh, or uh, rather the trends are moving away and criminals realizing the higher values from the intellectual property theft. <coughs> of data that is not obviously monetizable but can be used in other means, for example, insider trading uh, and high-frequency trading based on the stolen information. So that's the future. Another mm -hmm. future is, of course, uh, getting, getting more and learning more from the defenders. Like we talked about the LDAP enumeration, enumeration technique that TrickBot uses, which is a very common pen testing task that they learn from the, uh, presumably, from the white hats. So yet again, and that's where the future goes from the e-crimes and sophisticated groups. No longer they rely on uh, one individual to do them. It's a corporate cyber criminal infrastructure. And if you think about them, if you really want to think about hackers, you have to think like them. And to truly beat them, you have to be ahead of them and learning about them. As they look into us, we should be looking into them and studying them because that's the only way for us to approach the e-crime. Thank you. <laughs>